Hi, everybody. I'm going to go ahead and get started just so we give Dr. Zotmari as much time as he possibly can have. But it, I'm Kathy Lord. Um, I am part of CART here at UCLA, and it's my privilege today to introduce you um, to uh, Dr. Peter Zatmari here from Hospital for Sick Kids, the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, or CAM, and University of Toronto um, to talk to us. Um, I think I got this privilege of introducing Dr. Zatmari because maybe I've known him the longest, um, but he, I did not realize he was actually born in Regina, Saskatchewan, Peter, um, uh, and comes to us from Canada, having done most of his education at McMaster, which some of you probably Americans don't realize has a very um, uh, forward thinking, has always been one of the most forward thinking medical schools, I think, in North America. Um, he Dr. Zantmari not only got an MD and residency and fellowship in child and adolescent psychiatry, but also has an MSc in epidemiology. He's currently the Patsy and Jamie Anderson Chair in Child and Youth Mental Health at U of T or University of Toronto, as well as the chief of this collaboration between Hospital for Sick Kids, um, the program in child and adolescent mental health and addiction and the University of Toronto. He's known for many, many reasons. I think that he has been a tremendous leader within Canada, um, particularly from the point of view of psychiatric epidemiology and also early genetics. He became involved in some of the very earliest genetic studies of autism. Um, he's done not only autism, but also other disorders and I think has shifted from a very solid background in, in studies of autism to beginning to look at evidence-based patient-oriented systems of care um, and evaluation of models of care and is pushing all of us to do better and with the things that we feel like we already know. Um, I have to say that the two things I know about Dr. Zatmari is he did get me to eat ostrich meat once. <laughs> um, and I also accidentally once was sitting next to him in a panel and I waved my microphone and poured a pitcher of water over his head <laughs> and he just kept going. <laughs> Um, but the other thing to know about him, which is even more important, is that he has become a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, which is like being knighted, you guys. We don't have this here in the U.S., and he's really the first psychiatrist. And this is a recognition, I think, of both his high-quality, productive leadership in research, but also commitment to patient care. So, um, I do want to remind you that you can put questions in the Q&A mode of Zoom all through Dr. Zamari's talk, and we will try to curate these questions at the end. Um, and um, just thank Dr. Zamari for being here. So uh, it's, it's all yours, Peter. <laughs> thank you, Kathy. And thank you very much for that uh, very kind um, introduction. Um, I do remember uh, the time early on. It was in London, Ontario. As a matter of fact, Eric Schopler was there also talking on the panel where you soaked me with water. Uh, but it was uh, uh, not quite a baptism by fire, but it was a great experience uh, that I think brought us together with lifelong friendship. And so it is a great honor for me to uh, be the first lecturer this year for the CART uh, lectures in autism. It's the reason I have a tie on today. I haven't had a tie on uh, for many, many months. And I am very grateful for the invitation to present. And I hope that uh, the audience and everybody finds what I have to say interesting and, and worthy of discussion. And I look forward to that um, discussion. So the title of my presentation is Bringing Coals to Newcastle, Lessons Learned from Longitudinal Cohort Studies of Autism Spectrum Disorder. This is my financial disclosure. I get funds from CIHR, royalties from two books uh, that I've uh, published, but no other sources of funding and no conflicts of interest. So my objectives um, 
this afternoon for me. I wish I could be with you, uh, but unfortunately uh, we have to do it this way, which uh, 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 I'm sure will be just fine. But my objectives uh, this morning are to <clears throat> discuss a little bit about the design of cohort longitudinal studies, to do a very brief review and critical appraisal of cohort studies in autism spectrum disorder, I want to then highlight three findings from the Pathways in ASD study, which I've had the privilege of uh, being involved with for um, almost uh, 20 years now, talk about trajectories of different developmental domains, uh, illustrate the impact of school transitions on developmental trajectories, talk a little bit about identifying risk factors for comorbid anxiety in ASD via cascade models. I'd also like to illustrate how I think longitudinal designs can uncover interesting phenotype genotype correlations as well. I'm going to give you the punchline for the talk right away and the punchline is this. Um, I think we can all agree that uh, precision child health and precision child mental health is the paradigm of health for the 21st century. But I think the potential of a precision child health paradigm that can make a difference lies in solving the problem first of heterogeneity. And I also want to propose that I think time may be a key, if not the key, in solving that problem of heterogeneity. Now, you may ask why I entitled this presentation Coles to Newcastle or Owls to Athens or Oranges to Valencia or Water to Trois-Rivières, which by the way is in the province of um, Quebec. And uh, that really is to acknowledge the contribution that many of you in the audience have made to my thinking. Um, and I think to the impact that UCLA in general has had on the study of autism going back decades. Um, you may not know this, but actually I interviewed for a, for a fellowship in child and adolescent psychiatry at UCLA. I remember being interviewed by Denny Cantwell um, and uh, being interviewed by many other distinguished professors at UCLA many, many years ago. It was a great experience. I decided in the end not to come to UCLA, but I've always admired the work that uh, UCLA um, has done, and especially in the field of autism. So uh, I think what I'm, many of the things that I'm going to say may not be new to you, but I hope that I synthesize them in a way that might be refreshing and of interest. <clears throat> now, as I was thinking about doing this talk, I, I realized that after almost 40 years of work in the field of autism, autism spectrum disorder, I realized that I've been preoccupied basically with a single question. And that is how best to conceptualize between person and within person heterogeneity at a single point in time and over time. But in addition to that, I've also been trying to understand, <clears throat> excuse me, what might account for that variation and heterogeneity, which domains of heterogeneity are clinically meaningful, not all differences are clinically meaningful, and which domains of heterogeneity are in fact modifiable, perhaps the most important question. And after 40 years, I'm not sure I know, to be frank. But I do think that change over time is an important key to understanding heterogeneity in ASD. And I'm also confident that triangulating a variable-centered approach with a person-centered approach via cohort studies answers some of the questions that we've been confronted with but perhaps even more importantly, raises new ones that are interesting and I hope will be very clinically meaningful. Let's make sure that we <clears throat> together understand cohort studies um, in general. Cohort studies can be both prospective and retrospective. People don't 
sometimes forget that cohort studies can be retrospective. The key definition of a cohort study is that the sampling is by exposure rather than by the outcome. So a case control study, you have 50 cases of autism, say, 50 cases of kids with um, typically developing kids, and you look at a other variable uh, like theory of mind. So that's sampling by the outcome, the disorder that they have. In a cohort study, you sample by the exposure, that is the risk factor. And in many cases, that exposure can be within a population of people with autism, but now the exposure is the presence or absence of cognitive disability or the presence or absence of a language delay. And what is the impact of that on the outcome within the population of people with ASD. In fact, my first study in autism was a retrospective cohort study where I went to a center that um, serviced kids with autism in the 1950s, went back to capture those medical records and tried to trace those individuals to what they were like um, in the 1980s, how had they turned out? That was a retrospective cohort study. Cohort studies are rich. They can have many different uses, looking at the prevalence of an outcome, the predictors or risk factors associated with an outcome, prognosis studies, time to an outcome, rate, rate of change of an outcome, and on and on and on, to name just but a few. Regardless of the purpose, though, uh, cohort studies have some key methodologic issues that are worthwhile keeping in mind. First of all, is the importance of assembling an inception cohort. And by that, I mean systematic sampling at the same early stage of the disease or of the disorder. That's a key methodologic feature in cohort studies. Establishing a robust measurement model is important. Consideration of missing data Missing data is universal in longitudinal cohort studies. You're always going to have missing data. That's not the problem. The problem is whether the data are missing at random or missing not at random. And if they are missing not at random, which is most often the case, is that meaningful? Does it in fact bias the results? Another important issue is to be sure that the data points, the points at which you're collecting data, coincide with periods of important change. Change doesn't happen all the time. Change comes and goes. So it's important to time the data points to those periods of change. Another important issue is to think about the model of change that you have as you design the study. And does that suggest a variable-centered approach, which focuses on a variable? IQ change, autistic symptoms change, et cetera, et cetera, or a person-centered approach where you try and focus on people, subjects, and can we identify more homogeneous subgroups? For students in the audience, I'm a great believer in standardized reporting and standardized critical appraisal of research studies. I just point out these two really useful websites that I think uh, you, uh, students might pay attention to. The first is the, I'm not sure if you're aware of the Joanna Briggs Institute in Australia, but they have some really helpful critical appraisal tools, particularly for cohort studies. And these are very helpful for you to evaluate the um, extent to which cohort, a particular published cohort study um, uh, provides unbiased data. And then I'm also a strong, very strong believer in standardized reporting of observational studies. I don't know if you know STROBE, Strengthening the Reporting of Observational Studies in Epidemiology. It's a very useful tool. The website is the equatornetwork.org website. They've got reporting templates for all kinds of different studies. And I think STROBE, uh, which has a section for cohort studies, is particularly useful. Well, what do we know about longitudinal follow-up studies in autism spectrum disorder? And it turns out that there are three recent systematic reviews that have been published this year 
that were very well conducted and I think are very helpful. It's not surprising maybe that the conclusions of these three different systematic reviews are very similar. The outcome in ASD is generally poor. There are some developmental domains that are stable over time. There are others that improve. Uh, but perhaps more than anything else, these three systematic reviews highlight the variability in outcomes, the heterogeneity over time. And that this is a really a very striking finding in the follow-up literature. There's also some agreement on what some of the predictors of a poor outcome might be. And these include things like lack of fluent language before five years of age, lower intellectual ability, autism severity, um, etc. <clears throat> now, I think reading these systematic reviews, you come to realize that I think some of this literature has some blind spots. And these blind spots are in fact driven by certain untested assumptions. One of them is, is that the course of ASD is homogeneous. In other words, that the variation between individuals is simply a matter of scale. It's quantitative, not qualitative. Another often untested assumption is that the measurement model is appropriate. And by this, I mean that the different exposure or predictor variables are independent of each other. And the different outcome variables that you might look at are also independent of each other. And that the exposure and the outcome variables are independent. And when I mean independent, I mean independent from a measurement point of view in particular. So for example, our IQ and language ability independent domains? Is social communication independent of language? These kinds of things. Another important uh, blind spot, I think, is non-systematic sampling when that occurs and uh, not thought given to the extent to which this might bias the findings. And then little consideration, I think, of the impact of missing data on the findings and how that might skew the findings one way or another. In general, though, as you read these systematic reviews, you realize that high and large, there's been a focus on poor outcomes as opposed to good outcomes and a focus on child level predictors or risk factors, not so much family factors, community variables, health services, et cetera. Of course, as I say that, I catch myself and I realize this is except for the work of Kathy and of Connie, who have, I think, led the way in thinking about uh, other level predictors at the family level and at the community level and at health services level, and also beginning to think about good outcomes as opposed to poor outcomes. So with that background, I want to switch now to just talk a little bit about the pathways in ASD study, which really focuses on studying the outcome of preschool children with ASD from the point of diagnosis into emerging adulthood. We had some assumptions, and one was the importance of engagement with experts with lived experience with ASD in the initial design of the study. And we we asked parents and we asked adults with ASD to comment on how we should design the pathway study. We always carried with us the assumption that heterogeneity in course and in presentation was the rule, not the exception, and that we had to account for that. We wanted to pay careful attention to measurement models, we want to explore the possibility that complex, and by that I mean nonlinear associations, may exist between different developmental domains over time. We wanted to make sure that we could sample an inception cohort and that we paid careful attention to the impact of missing data, which would be, we knew, inevitable. So the Pathways in ASD study represents an inception cohort of 420 newly diagnosed children with ASD between two years of age and four years, 11 
months of age. So we tried to capture them as soon after the diagnosis was given as possible within that developmental span. The kids were sampled from five different Canadian cities, Halifax, Montreal, Hamilton, Edmonton, and Vancouver. And our data collection methods uh, have always been multi-method and multi-informant to make sure there was as much diversity in the measurement tools and the informants as we could possibly manage. The vision of the pathway study was to really look at variability across different developmental domains, across different contexts, child, family, services, school, and community, and across time from the point of their diagnosis between two and four years of age, and at key transitions at school entry, primary school, and to the end of adolescence. I want to just uh, uh, pause for a moment to talk about the importance of engagement of those with um, lived experience. We held a number of stakeholder conferences with parents, policymakers, clinicians, and researchers in the years 2000, 2004. Kathy came and talked at, I think, the very first one, and what we were interested in was trying to identify evidence gaps in the literature on early intervention uh, in autism, because that was such a controversial issue in Canada at the time. Over the course of those four annual conferences, the group of stakeholders identified 10 clinical questions that were of relevance to them. And these stakeholders were parents, clinicians, policymakers, and researchers. And then we asked, we gave all of them monopoly money, and we said, put your money on which of the 10 questions you think is most important that we should address. And actually, the group of us, the investigators, were quite surprised that the top question that people asked us to address was, what are the factors associated with a good outcome in autism spectrum disorder. And it was that stimulus that gave, uh, gave us the stimulus to submit the grant to CIHR in 2004. We were lucky to get it funded and we now have funding to the year uh, 2022. Uh, and I'm not sure what's gonna happen after 2022. This is uh, some of the sample characteristics of the pathway study. You can see here the number of uh, kids from the different uh, study sites. These are the uh, Merrill Palmer developmental index score and the PLS score, a measure of language. Fairly typical, I think, of this sample of uh, ASD children at this age. This is what I want to uh, you to pay, to pay attention to is that here's the age of diagnosis, 3.18 uh, years, and then the age of enrollment in the study very shortly thereafter. So we were, I think, able to capture and enroll the kids into the study soon after the diagnosis. It's not the same early stage of their disorder, but if we use diagnosis in this age span as a proxy for that, um, I think we did reasonably well. And you can see the uh, sex ratio um, at birth is uh, heavily favored for boys, perhaps more so because of this developmental stage than at other developmental stages. Um, some of you may have seen uh, these tables, but I just wanted to uh, uh, highlight these uh, to just show you the some of the important findings when we took a trajectory-based modeling approach and how that highlighted diversity in different pathways. So this is on the left-hand side. This is the ADOS severity metric. This is at time one, uh, at uh, 40 months of age, uh, when the kids were en enrolled in the study, and they're followed till six years, roughly six years of age three data points for the ADOS, for the Vineland on the right-hand side. Again, uh, from time one, the point of enrollment until six years of age, four data points for the Vineland. We applied this PROCTRAG trajectory-based modeling to try and identify more homogeneous subgroups based on their 
developmental course based on change over time? Can we identify more ho homogeneous subgroups based on how they would change over time? And you can see for the ADOS severity metric, basically we came up with two different developmental trajectories. One group, um, uh, sorry, uh, one group uh, uh, that has sort of more severe and stable ADOS scores over time. And then a second group of roughly 10% of the population uh, with uh, less severe and improving ADOS scores over time. For the Vineland, uh, we had came up with three developmental trajectories that provided the best fit to the model, a lower functioning uh, trajectory, slightly worsening over time, a moderate functioning trajectory that was pretty stable, and then a higher functioning trajectory that was more um, improving over time. So these models, and I emphasize the word models because they're hypothesis generating rather than hypothesis testing. But these models suggest that different children with ASD follow different developmental trajectories over time, at least as we're looking at these two domains of ASD symptom severity and adaptive functioning. But another interesting finding from these data, I think, is that the heterogeneity between the groups um, uh, 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 increases over time. So within the ADOS, within the Vineland, the heterogeneity between the two or three trajectories increases over time. It's like they're fanning out over time. If we look at the degree of overlap between developmental uh, between the developmental domains, between the ADOS trajectories and the Vineland trajectories, yes, there's a little bit of overlap. So those who are uh, improving in their ADOS scores are slightly more likely to be in the higher functioning, improving Vineland trajectory. But actually, the strength of that correlation is very weak and barely significant. So there's a little bit of yoking of trajectories, but not very much. And then again, it's important to remember that these models need to be validated with independent data. So it looks like if we look at independent data, parent reports of ASD, for example, instead of the ADOS, look at IQ scores, language, internalizing, externalizing pro, uh, uh, problems, by and large, these different trajectories in either the ADOS or the Vineland uh, have some construct validity. Now, I think these messages actually generalize to other developmental domains amongst the different papers that we've published. I, I think we can take it as a rule that different kids follow different developmental trajectories. The number and the shape of trajectories may vary by the outcome domain. If we're looking at symptoms, cognitive skills, adaptive functioning, mental health trajectories, all similar stories. But that heterogeneity within a particular domain increases over time. And while there's some degree of overlap between the domains, really by and large, there's little yoking of trajectories and less yoking over time as well. And I think this supports really the principle of chronogeneity that Stelios Georgiadis and Summer Bishop and Tom Fraser wrote about in the Journal of Child Psychology and Psychiatry. I really like the idea of chrono, chronogeneity that uh, these uh, folks came up with. And I think that's a nice theme to put together. Okay, so if that's in large part a fairly consistent story that we see on the developmental trajectory um, uh, uh, issue, can we use some of these data or these approaches to influence policy? I think you all appreciate that not all policy questions can be answered by clinical trials. Policy changes are driven by many sources of evidence, and I'll just point you to the implementation of uh, uh, early intensive behavioral interventions that were implemented on a wide scale in Canada well before rigorous randomized control trials uh, were conducted. 
In the absence of clinical trials, cohort studies, I think, can be very useful. And I'm going to talk a little bit about school transition as an example. So what do we know about school transitions in autism spectrum disorder? Uh, most of the work has been done on transitions into adulthood. But the transition from early, the early years into the primary school uh, is a key experience for many families who have a child with ASD. There's two really nice systematic reviews that have been recently uh, published. Uh, the one by Nuska et al. includes uh, Dr. Kazari. So I'll just point that out. Again, bringing Coles to Newcastle. The conclusion, I think, of these two systematic reviews is pretty consistent, and that is that the transition is difficult for those with ASD, the transition into school from the early school years. However, I think both of these systematic reviews highlight that most of the studies have really taken a, taken a variable centered approach. That is, there's an increase in behavior problems, an increase in autistic symptoms, for example, and have used uh, two data points. I wanted to highlight a paper that Stelio Sturgiatis uh, published based on the Pathways data that was published this year uh, in February. And that is to think about transition to school as a key turning point in the trajectories. And turning point is an important concept in lifespan epidemiology. It really refers to, is there a change in the slope of a trajectory over time at key points? And so Stelios and the team were really interested to see whether there might be a change in the slope of the trajectory in the transition to school. And he used the ADOS uh, severity metric as the trajectory, did the group-based trajectory, was able, to, these are, this now I'll just say is the pathway sample, um, and the endpoint is now 10 years of age. So this is the beginning at two to four years of age, four data points now uh, at, uh, and the final one at 10, 10 years of age. And again, two trajectories uh, were identified with the uh, group-based trajectory modeling. But the interesting thing is the change in the slope over time. So for example, the uh, uh, sort of the more severe stable trajectory of ADOS kind of improves a little bit, but then plateaus out over time. Whereas the group that slightly has slightly lower ADOS scores at the beginning also improves um, initially, but instead of plateauing out, they continue to improve over time. I lose my cursor every once in a while. So uh, I hope you can see how there's a plateauing out, but then there's a resumption of a reduction of, uh, uh, in the autistic symptoms over time. So this is a nice illustration of how the slope changes over time at a key turning point. However, I think uh, a point that was made in the paper that's really key and these are the individual trajectories, the trajectories of individual children in the first group, the higher, more stable group, and in the second group over time. Uh, you can see that there's way more heterogeneity in the group that's improving over time than there is um, in the group that appears to be more stable. Uh, so there's something else that's going on uh, that is unaccounted for that's uh, driving the variation in the individual trajectories in the group that's improving. But I think the lesson we need to learn from this is that there's something that these kids have that these kids don't have, and that if we could translate that and help these kids, that that would improve their trajectory so that they could jump trajectories from one to the other. I wanted to talk now a little bit about risk factors and can we identify risk factors from cohort studies? I don't know if you're aware of this, but JAMA has a new policy and they've stated that the term risk factor is reserved only for randomized controlled trials. So uh, this was new to me, 
um, uh, a little bit disconcerting, but who am I to argue with the editor of JAMA? But you can't use the term risk factor uh, unless you're uh, talking about a randomized controlled trial. I think others might say that accumulating evidence that a risk factor predicts an outcome uh, can be strengthened by a number of different methodologic uh, design decisions. The importance of the measurement independence of exposure and outcome, controlling for the status of the outcome at baseline, making sure that you control for potential confounding variables, doing a sensitivity analysis that is are the results robust to changes in <clears throat> bits of the sample or other instruments or other analytic approaches? Testing for mediators and moderators of change um, and allowing for more complex patterns of interaction like cascade models. So I agree, we can't make causal statements based on cohort studies or longitudinal studies, one can identify risk factors, I think, but it's generally understood that the effect size of the risk factor in a cohort study would be inflated compared to studying that same risk factor in a randomized control trial. <clears throat> so now I want to just illustrate uh, this. Uh, by looking at whether we can identify risk factors for anxiety in autism spectrum disorder. And this is, I'm going to be quoting the work of a, one of our students, uh, Danielle Barabo, who's a child and adolescent psychiatrist and doing her uh, PhD. And she's been interested in anxiety in ASD. This is an important problem, as I'm sure you're all aware. Very high rates of comorbidity. Anxiety disorders affect maybe roughly 40% of children with ASD. It's difficult to recognize and diagnose. It has a major impact on outcome and quality of life. We have some but few evidence-based treatments and I'm not aware at least of data on prevention of anxiety, which would be very meaningful clinically. <clears throat> So Danielle was interested in asking whether insistence on sameness might be a risk factor for uh, anxiety disorders. Kanner originally recognized a very close relationship between anxiety and insistence on sameness. Empirical studies have demonstrated cross-sectionally that the two were highly correlated in many different samples, many different circumstances. And from a measurement point of view, more importantly, an important paper by uh, Kathy Gotham and Kathy Lord, 2013, showing in cross-sectionally again, that there is um, a construct validity to the independence of these two uh, developmental domains. So Danielle was interested in sort of elucidating the relationship between insistence on sameness and anxiety symptoms in children with ASD. Do they influence each other or is it more of a unidirectional kind of relationship? More specifically, she wanted to test out whether there might be reciprocal effects between insistence on sameness as measured by the repetitive behavior scale and anxiety as measured by the CBCL over time that might guide subsequent prevention and treatment initiatives. And by reciprocal effects, I mean cascading effects that influence each other over time. So Danielle took a variable centered approach. So using structural equation modeling and four data points uh, for anxiety at four, six, eight, and 10 years of age no, sorry, four data points for insistence on sameness, four data points for anxiety, and building models that become more and more complex, looking at stability of the two domains, their correlation at each time point, but also whether there are cascading effects. In other words, does anxiety at one time point influence insistence on sameness at a subsequent time point, and vice versa? Does insistence on sameness influence anxiety at a subsequent time point. <clears throat> 
And this is the best fitting model that uh, she uh, determined in the end. Um, and the uh, results suggest, for example, that there is very good stability or high stability for anxiety over time uh, between time one and time four, high stability and insistence on sameness over time, a strong correlation between insistence on sameness and anxiety at the first time point, which lessens over time and then becomes non-significant at the final time point, and no reciprocal effects, only unidirectional effects. So that insistence on sameness at six and insistence on sameness at eight years of age influences anxiety at a subsequent time point, but anxiety does not influence insistence on sameness at a subsequent time point once you control for all these other correlations, which is the beauty of using structural equation models over time. So the conclusion of these um, uh, cross lag panel models, which were which are, they're formally called, <clears throat> is that both anxiety and insistence on sameness appear to be stable over time. The association between the two domains is strong at first and then diminishes over time. Insistence on sameness may ask as a risk factor for later anxiety. She did a sensitivity analysis and the, ro the results appear to be robust to adjusting for age at study intake and these other variables. This leads us to asking what the mechanism might be. It's really interesting uh, what the mechanism might be. Intolerance of uncertainty may be a domain that these two, um, or it may be a construct that these two developmental domains have in common. Or it may be that insistence on sameness prevents the use of more adaptive coping strategies. And I think the implication really is it's worthwhile testing whether treating insistence on sameness or replacing insistence on sameness with more effective coping strategies might lead to a reduction in anxiety later on. Well, I can't come to UCLA and not talk about genotype phenotype correlations and the potential of cohort studies to be helpful in this context. Um, I, you know, it's undeniable we've made great progress in uncovering ASD risk genes, but I think it would be fair to say that understanding genotype phenotype correlations have been a, more difficult to document. The usual strategy of stratifying the phenotype of a heterogeneous sample of ASD subjects has not been all that successful in identifying GWAS signals or linkage peaks or whatever. Maybe a subgrouping by genetic variants could solve the problem of heterogeneity, lead to clearer correlations. And I point to this uh, very interesting paper uh, that was recently published on a genetics first approach. And I'll highlight again that two of the authors of that paper are from UCLA. One of the other authors of that paper is my friend and colleague, Jacob Vorstman, who works with me at SickKids. The paper um, uh, collected subjects with 16P deletions and duplications and 22Q deletions and duplications, compared them to each other and to a more heterogeneous group of ASD subjects. The interesting conclusion to me of that particular study is that there's much greater phenotypic variation within CNV subgroups than between the CNV subgroups. And that should not be surprising because this is a cross-sectional study with a sample with wide variation in age. And if we learned one thing from the trajectory studies, it's that between person variation is a function of time. It's a function of development. And that once I think the extent of heterogeneity driven by time in ASD is appreciated, longitudinal studies may hold some advantages. And I'm going to just, I think, illustrate that really quickly with a different disorder, the 22Q deletion and schizophrenia. So we know that one in four kids with 22Q deletion syndromes develop schizophrenia. It's developed uh, 
the deletion is identified typically very early, um, but it's also associated with uh, all kinds of neurodevelopmental disorders and with schizophrenia with the age of onset around 18 years of age. Now, let's take that into account. This is a slide showing the cumulative decline in verbal IQ over time for subjects with a 22Q deletion. And there is a slow plateauing decline in verbal IQ. If, however, you take out those who de develop schizophrenia at the mean age of 18 years of age, you can see that this decline in IQ occurs much earlier than, um, uh, than the onset of the psychosis, indicating that taking a longitudinal approach to parsing the phenotypic heterogeneity might be very useful in understanding genotype-phenotype correlations. So my key messages, the importance of time as a moderator of the phenotype, a driver of both intra-individual and inter-individual variation. Combining a gene-first approach, I think with different developmental trajectories to parse this phenotypic heterogeneity might be a very useful um, approach. But there's a cost to all this, and I wanna end with the cost. And that is that the cost of parsing heterogeneity longitudinally leads to increasing levels of complexity in our models of ASD. The more trajectories that we select as the best fit to the model, the, sorry, the more trajectories we choose to look at, the better the fit of the model is. But the more trajectories, the more complex the model is, and the, yes, the less useful that model is. And from a translational point of view, clinical decision-making depends on parsimony and complexity is a problem when it comes to clinical decision-making. And I think this is an unresolved tension in not only our field, but in the whole paradigm of precision child health. The key, I think, to precision child health, the personalizing of interventions based on individual characteristics is solved by solving the problem of heterogeneity in ASD. And I would propose that change over time is a key characteristic that could be useful in this endeavor. But different models of change may fit equally. And there's this tension between complexity and parsimony in our prediction and trajectory models that we've not resolved. There's no right model, as Kathy said in this paper that I think is um, absolutely crucial for understanding uh, change over time. And the usefulness of our different models still need to be tested and evaluated in precision child health clinical trials. I hope I've stimulated you to think about engaging and embarking on the next generation of cohort studies. There are lots of other things that we need to be thinking about with longitudinal studies. We've barely scratched the surface. Common outcome measures. We have all these different cohort studies using different measures by and large. As a field, we need to agree on a common outcome set. We need to think of creative ways of engaging families with autism and people with autism uh, in order to um, enlighten and design our studies. We need to embed randomized control trials in very large cohort studies with large sample sizes. We should be sampling purposefully more girls, those with genetic variants, those with a family history, those with medical conditions. We need to collect health services data, especially with an equity, diversity, and inclusion lens. And I know Connie's been a very strong advocate of this and has done fantastic work in this area. Thinking about turning points and transitions where trajectories can go awry would be really important. And finally, taking a strengths-based approach, not a deficit-based approach, to think about good outcomes, protective factors, and resilience, I think, is a lens that would be really important in the next generation of studies. <clears throat> I need to thank 
the Pathways team. We've been together for almost 20 years. Uh, we still love each other, haven't gotten into a fight, which is really quite uh, remarkable. And I need to acknowledge the many different funders that have supported us um, over the years. Thank you very much. That's the end of my presentation.